How are you doing, everybody? Uh, welcome. Uh, my, name, my name is Porik Lynch. I'm a lecturer in design and creative media at ATU Donegal, and I'm joined today by... Uh, Dr. Mark Porter. I'm the head of online learning at ATU Donegal. And today we're, we're going to uh, talk about the, the following topic. So enhancing the teaching and learning experience for 100% online courses through immersive VR workspaces. So we're going to talk through a few things today. Um, we're going to start off with the current state of online teaching and learning, which we're all very familiar with. We'll have a quick overview then of VR in education, and then we'll start to get into the project that we're currently working on and the, the implementation of that, and also the troubleshooting that we've come across in in the process of that and then I talk a little bit about what we're doing in VR uh, and what the plan our plans are for over the next year or two so the first thing that uh, I wanted to discuss was the current state of online teaching and learning you see two photographs over here on the right hand side the one on the top right is uh, something you'll all be familiar with. It's the, the Teams where you have the only camera switched on. <laughs> um, and this was, I suppose this was a result of the, the pandemic when we all were, we all jumped online and uh, we were faced with, with this kind of scenario where the class, some of them would have the camera switched on, some of them wouldn't. Uh, and and there, was a, there was a lack of, uh, I suppose, empathy in that space. And it was difficult to know who was engaged and who wasn't. So that's that was kind of your typical, I suppose, first year group in particular. I suppose they, they hadn't even met their fellow students. Um, so I'm not surprised they didn't switch it off. And there was all this anxiety around that. Um, so it was a difficult, difficult time for, for students and staff. On the bottom here then is a different story. So similar, similar platform, OK, through through MS Teams. Um, but uh, but this is a postgrad postgraduate group and that we found that that was a different engagement altogether because they were so used to engaging with remote working and they were used to being on teams um it was a different experience for them but you can see also within that picture over on the right hand side the mb and gc that's a couple of students as well that aren't fully engaged so the, it's just the camera's not switched on but you, you just you're missing out on something there so the pandemic really changed everything and I suppose whether you were using MS Teams or, or Blackboard Collaborator or, or something else, you were seeing these things starting to happen. Um, and I suppose that's where different types of software would have, we were being asked to adopt at that time. Uh, and just to add to that, as Parik was saying there, you know, there's no perfect tool out there for that, you know, active learner. Um, there's lots of tools that have been added on to the likes of Collaborate and Teams to try and encourage engagement such as Padlet and Mentimeter. So, you know, it's trying to bring something different that might improve that engagement. So one of the biggest issues um, for us was the, the loss of empathy that was happening. You, you just weren't getting the same opportunities that you would get in the, in the classroom. So in the classroom, for example, you, you can see the student, you can see if they need help. Uh, you can tell if a group dynamic is working, you know, just by just by watching them and, and the sounds that come out of particular groups. Uh, if someone left the class to go and get the bus, for example, you would see that happening. Uh, whereas if, if you were on uh, on a VLE, you wouldn't catch that up. You know, if you're on Teams, you just you just don't see that person person leaving. The camera's off, and you don't know if they're they're there or not unless you ask a question, and you might get a, an answer or you might not. So th there's direct communication with the student individually and as a group was was lacking. Um, but VLE such as as Blackboard, uh, there's a lot of unknowns. You know, with uh, collaborate on Teams, so the camera's off maybe no response uh, logged on but not actually there and then you can't see you can't see the smile the laugh or or even the hand going up i know ms teams has this hand up facility um and a lot of people forget to bring bring that hand back down that'll come up again later on but um yeah so there's lots of those opportunities for empathy that were definitely um missing that were in the classroom but not in the likes of teams and collaborate 
Um, so just to add to what Parik was saying, we, we asked ourselves a question. So, you know, how do we recreate the engagement and the, the nuances that happen in class? So just to elaborate a bit further on what Parik was saying there, you know, that sort of automatic or instinctive peer to peer discussion that happens between students, you know, you have that sort of on the fly question and which then encourages discussion. Um, and you've all those visual cues that Parik sort of mentioned there, you know, putting your hand up, you know, seeing if a student's disengaged, seeing if they're on their mobile. You don't have any of that with regards to desktop online learning um, because the camera can be off and the mic can be off. Um, so we started to look at VR to see how we could bring some of these elements back into online learning. And I'm just going to give you a bit of an overview now of how sort of VR is used in education at the moment. So it's commonly used in sort of five ways. You have it as a communication tool, a workflow tool uh, for gamification, for virtual tasks and simulation. And I'll put some examples to that now. Um, you know, in nursing education at the minute, uh, VR has been used as a competencies tool for training practical skills, very akin to what you would get uh, in the aviation industry and how pilots are trained. So they can accrue, you know, a number of virtual hours before they actually go and complete the task. Um, in respect to the design industry, it's been used as a special uh, CAD tool, which is computer aided design, where people can jump into VR. So, for example, in the car industry, you have a lot of car designers now who are creating CAD models, dropping the model in VR, and then they can actually go and interact with it one to one so they can see what the interior is like. They can see how the engine fits in the chassis and so on. Um, also, in uh, the design industry, you have uh, and fine art, you have people now creating special fine art where they go on and they can paint in 3D and they're creating a lot of new sort of um, paradigms with regards how you can interact with that as well, you know. Uh, probably two of the most common ways that's used in education would be virtual labs. Uh, so, for example, in science and engineering, you have a lot of the experiments that are being recreated in virtual reality that students can then access remotely. And that's done from the point of view of uh, training so you can actually give them training and how to use that piece of equipment before they get to actually come in and use it in class um, and also to actually possibly go through the experiment and get virtual data that they can then analyze themselves at home um, and probably the last and most commonly known example is scenario based learning so for example if you really think of you know history for example you could drop somebody back in the dinosaur period so they could walk with the t-rex you know, to see what the scales like of that type of dinosaur, what their behavior is like, you know, things like that would be typically very difficult to recreate, uh, you know, because they're too expensive or too difficult to create in real life. So in virtual reality, it's a perfect tool for that. I've got a nice example here that I want to play, uh, and it's called Infinite Office, and it's an example of how VR is used as a workflow tool. So this example is a mixed reality example where they're meshing virtual reality with the real world. And I'll just play the video here now.
Good stuff. Thanks, Mark. I thought you were going to start dancing there. <laughs> yeah, so we're, we're using VR really to encourage active engagement to try and get that going again. And we've got to a point now within this module, uh, the Emerging Technology module on the UX course, that, that we're, um, we're really starting to see that active engagement starting to happen, seeing that start, starting to see the group dynamic uh, coming back. Um, we're also trying to enhance the online learning experience. So the students that are, we've got 10 master students working in this capacity at the minute. All, they've all got Oculus 2 headsets um, and they're documenting a blog as they go. So they've got their uh, um, VR classroom blog. So it'll be interesting to see what comes back from them when they submit. Um, and I, I think that'll, that'll lead us to more research. Um, but we're also exploring, I suppose, what's coming out of this is, is a new mode of, of deliver, delivery especially in around um, blended learning. So previously, I suppose the traditional route of blended learning was you had a percentage of the course might be online uh, and a percentage of the course might be on campus. Because the, the, the UX course that we're currently working with, it's 100% online. It went that direction after, after the pandemic or during it. Um, and we've got students from Malaysia and Brazil and um, UK, Donegal, Mayo, all over. But I suppose what we're noticing is that there's it's it's not uh, feasible for them to come onto campus. So this VR classroom environment is is stepping into that space where they can meet their peers, they can form friendships, they can um, work collaboratively, and we see that kind of a different mode of, of uh, or a different kind of blended uh, delivery model. Um, just do you want to talk a bit about the the tools there, Mark? Yeah, no problem. Uh, as Park mentioned, uh, what we have is the Oculus Quest 2, but just to make you aware that that's been rebranded by Facebook and it's now called Meta Quest 2, just if you're looking to purchase any of these. Um, so why we went with the Oculus Quest 2 was it was considered one of the best VR experiences on the market. Um, it was also probably one of it's the most commercial. Uh, you can buy the headset now for approximately 350 euros. It offers six degrees of freedom, which typically a lot of the modern headsets allow. So that's just how you can actually move about in virtual space. Um, you have it's a mixed reality headset, so you have the virtual capacity, but you've also like you've seen infinite op office there where you can actually see the real world as well. So that's a really nice touch. It's called pass through an Oculus. Uh, you have two controllers which have great feedback and they're very easy to use and they're, they, they actually track really well in VR. You've also got the capacity to with the Oculus Quest 2 to have hands free. So it's a uh, hand tracking built into it as well, which is very cool to try out. Um, so when we first looked at the headset, you had a, a facility with Oculus called Oculus for Business, but that was discontinued in December because they rebranded it Meta and they're going to come out with a new ver variation of that now in the next coming year. So we had a pivot and we went with a third party application called Manage XR. So that's basically allows us to access and manage all the applications on the headset from uh, cloud capacity. We looked at numerous applications uh, in relation to the delivery of this. Um, a lot of the tools that we looked at, such as uh, Horizon Workrooms, Alt, uh, Alt Space and Spatial are all sort of collaborative tools, um, which are very feature rich and have you know, tools like you would get in Miro. Uh, the one we went with was Spatial, uh, again, because it was free. And with the free capacity, with the free version, you had a capacity of up to 30 participants could actually enter into that experience. Um, so just on to the next slide here, I've got a, a video to give you an idea of what Spatial is like, what you can do in it. And one of probably there's a couple of reasons here why we chose this application as well from our own experience of playing about with it. You know, we found that engagement was obvious because in VR, it's not just like the desktop environment we are looking forward all the time. It's a spatial environment, so you can move about in 3D space. You have to move your head to look to the left, to look to the right. You know, you have spatial sound where somebody can be standing behind you and you'll hear them from the left hand side. You know, active engagement is inherent because, again, you have to have the headset on, you have to have controllers in your hand and you have to be active while you're interfacing with the applications in VR. And, you know, we seen that collaboration was intuitive. You were getting back to that sort of face to face environment where people were becoming comfortable and they were having conversations again. And, you know, you were seeing that they were engaged. So we'll just play this video here of special to give you an overview of the application.
So I think that this this leap from you know the the initial concept to getting all the students, myself and, and Mark, into into spatial into the one room to be able to work together, uh, didn't didn't come easy at all. Um, so we we had initial support, you know, for, from the school, which was great. So that allowed us to get the get the headsets on board for for the students. But then the immediate thing was, was how do we how do we loan these out? You know, because we've got students to say in Kuala Lumpur, in in Rio, and in in, uh, in UK, and, and all over Ireland as well. So the first thing was, do we you know do, do we loan these out? Do the students purchase their own or what? So we would have to have us think away around that. So we ended up uh, it was just like. Um, you know, taking equipment out of, out of the, the college. Uh, and then there was obviously postage as well and shipping. And so that that became a bit of a nightmare, but we got through all that there. Uh, and then we started to get into the whole, we noticed there was going to be a huge tech learning curve because of the students coming from different directions, but also, you know, language barriers, but also uh, technical, different technical capabilities around the hardware and software, um, particularly around onboarding. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, the list of headings we have here, if you're if you're thinking about implementing VR and teaching, this is the pitfalls that you have to think about. Uh, we learn very fast that there is a there is a technical learning curve to this. Um, you know, when you have people coming in from different levels of experience who have no technical ability to people who can use technology, no problem. Um, you always have to work to the slowest person. Um, and one of the things that we learned is you have to have everybody Sort of going slow at the start and starting from the same point because if you have people who are advanced and who are in the applications and you have other people who haven't even set up their wi-fi or maybe you don't you know they're not aware of the interface because when you know we're introducing something here that's completely disruptive uh, there's people who don't know what vr is so you're handing them a headset and controllers which are completely alien to them they're nothing like a keyboard and mouse um, then when you get into the applications themselves, you're dealing with you know a spatial environment, spatial um, UX that you have to learn, you know relearn how to actually navigate and be able to do things in. So onboarding is really important here. Uh, you have to again start slow. I think one of the things that I've learned from this is uh, building up people's experience and ways to do that. I think one of the best ways I think to approach this is pick simple applications or games that allow people to build up their experience. One of the ones that I like to introduce people to is Beat Saber, the demo, because you've a few clicks, you're into the application, and then when you start the game, you're only actually waving the controllers about to play the actual game, but it's building people's experience up, getting them uh, used to VR, getting them their, the, sort of their v, VR legs under them. Um, and in that, you know, you have the staff, you have to get ready, you have the students, you have to get ready. The training is similar. Uh, in that regard, um, but one of the biggest pains that we had was doing this all remotely. We had nobody in house where we could problem solve um, and resolve problems quickly. Everything was done online uh, and it was very difficult to manage that. We did do it um, and you know we're getting to that point where we're sort of establishing best practice on how to do that. Um, and I'll explain some of that later on in the presentation. Just Again, on, on, that, on that there as well, you know, there was as far as from a teaching point of view, there was the actual content that you were teaching wasn't a whole pile different. So I was teaching a, a process and I wanted to try and do that within VR. So the, the actual teaching content didn't change that much, but it was it was just getting used to delivering in, in that new environment. And it, you couldn't you couldn't have done it without having um, the learning support, you know, from from Mark there. So when that was in place, so if, if I'm in class and I'm teaching, you would also have these technical difficulties coming in. So having somebody else in the class that was able to manage that allowed me to get on with you know more teaching and feedback whatever it was so that was invaluable having uh having that assistance there um helped it work yeah definitely and like that's one of the you know the recommendations you'll see at the end is you definitely need a technical support when you're trying to deliver the likes of this in a class environment um just to follow on you know uh, again we had the initial issue with oculus for business and it was discontinued and we had to pivot to a different management software system. So you, again, you have the whole setup of these uh, headsets. Again, there's no best practice on how to do it. Um, you know, if you're using Oculus, you can't escape the fact that you have to have a Facebook account to set the device up. There are ways around that after you have the devices set up where you can sideload applications in. Uh, again, these are all learning curves. A lot of this information is very, very new with these headsets, uh, like connection issues, you know, 
that's the same whether you're on a desktop or in VR. You're going to ha have to ensure that there's good internet wherever you are. Um, and again, from the management side of things, um, because we were going through the the micro or the Oculus ecosystem, we were tied into the Facebook account. And you know, if you have ten headsets, that means you have to have ten Facebook accounts. Well, we sort of cheated in that regard, where we set them all up under one account. But what that meant was we couldn't use the standard Oculus interface because when we try to load on applications uh, with multiple people in the same account, it wouldn't let us do it. So that's why we had to then have the Manage XR software where we could uh, add them on via that through the cloud. So we were able then to go to Oculus, download APKs of the applications and put them on that way. The only problem with that was you have to constantly uh, look for updates um, because because these applications are so new and they're developing so quickly, there's always updates, you know, every other week or every month. So you have to keep an eye on that, so that it doesn't a, disrupt the class. There's a definite feeling of, you know, that the, 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 they were set up and, and letting you go, but they were just letting us play and see what happened. They, they, they weren't fully set up at their end, for sure, Oculus. <laughs> oh, definitely not. Um, and I suppose one of the biggest things too to think about is this is a completely new workflow for a lot of people. Um, you're taking them out of the desktop uh, keyboard interface and you're taking them into virtual reality. You know, you have to keep that in mind. And again, one of the things would be go slow at the start um, and try and get people to play with it, play the games, build up their experience in that regard. Yeah, but it wasn't, it wasn't all painful. To, so we, we did have fun in, in the process. That, and that's definitely something that you that we see coming back into this, into the VR classroom. There, there's uh, you can see people bouncing off each other again, you know, literally bouncing off each other. And so there is this fun element as part of it, you know, and that definitely comes up, especially within group work within there. Um, so this is our first day, actually, as we believe we're really from the first day, uh, just to see, show you what, what went wrong or how badly it went. <laughs> that was a long day. <laughs> I think the first thing is to probably stick it on our heads and see what happens. <laughs> Wonders are batteries in it. Yeah. No, there's no batteries in it. Oh, that's for sure. Then me and Park stole your battery. Go to the go to the second drawer. <laughs> <laughs> you have to move to Mayo to get it to work, you know. <laughs> so the 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 balloon, you know, place with the hot air balloons and the palm trees, is that kind of home? You know, with, we need these kind of difficulties because they're going to come up again and again. We need to find out how to I can't take it seriously. Like, not even a wee bit seriously. Hi. <laughs> okay. Oh, that's nuts. This is very minority report. This is like the nicest day we've had all year, and we're sitting here with headsets on. <laughs> oh, that's super. Yeah, that was that was good. That was good crack. That was that was the first day. We just another minute or two to, to wrap it up here. Definitely, uh, empathy is um, is an abundance within this space. You know, you can walk around and you can see what people are doing. You can see if people are engaged. Um, there's instant collaboration, so you you can clap, you can nod, you can gesture to somebody, you can high five, you can wave. Um, but then, in in the opposite way, it is completely obvious when somebody's not engaged. So somebody will be switched off, they will be static, you know, they won't be moving within the space. And that's the difference, I suppose, between this and the likes of Microsoft Teams or Blackboard Collaborate or whatever. Um, you can see that uh, there's lots more opportunities for empathy and we're noticing that daily. Just on that as well, I suppose you, you can see that the whole, the whole hand up thing. So when you're in MS Teams and you see the hand going up and it stays up and it doesn't come down, that doesn't happen in VR. If someone's walking around with their hand up, there's something something definitely wrong. If they keep it up, you know, usually if they get your attention, they'll put their hand down. I think little things, intricacies like that there, um, the nodding, the clapping, the happy accidents. Um, there's definitely, the movement is obvious. Movement is a big thing and, and it does get active learning really really coming to the fore. And just before we wind up, wind up here, we had um, James Corbett on from Air Immersive. He's, he's one of the, the guys that's involved in, in the writing of the Irish Immersive Technology Industry Landscape Report. 
worth very very much worth a look. You'll find it on LinkedIn. But he was on giving a talk, and uh, he finished his talk with NVR with the class, and then he bowed, you know, gestured to bow, and and the class gave him a round of applause. That was kind of one of those moments we were just didn't expect, and it happened. Uh, the first day we were on as well, we we went into a public uh, area. Um, and we bumped into this guy from Japan, just came up, walked up to us and says, what are you doing in here? And we told him all about the course. And uh, so it's, there's definitely opportunities for recruitment in there. Um, and also there's there's uh, selfie capacity in there to take photographs. We started off just messing about taking selfies, um, but it ended up being a tool to, to document your work or your process through, through, uh, through VR. I suppose from my perspective, being in there as support, you could see that it give, you know, Parik, the academic, more time to spend with the students to go through the course content. Whereas if there was an issue, I would just take the person out on the teams, we would resolve that and then come back into the VR space. Um, you know, the applications that we're using, they're open 24 seven. So Parik's course is international. So those people here in different time zones have no issue accessing that content. I don't know if you want to say anything about the reflective practice, Parik. Um. No, I think what the, I've mentioned that before. The students are going to be working on that over over the next couple of weeks, just finishing it off. Um, she was going to the last slide there, Mark. Yeah, no problem. And these are just some of the examples of what we were doing in the actual class itself. Yeah, let's put some screenshots from spatial there. So just on that, on what's next, we're go, we're the next stage is is to try and get some training going for staff and students. We want to streamline that a little bit more. We can't be spending six weeks, you know, for the next time we do this in the module, getting people on board. We need to find some way of doing that, whether it's through videos or PDFs, develop further modules, you know, uh, or tweak current modules and other courses. There's definitely more research outputs out of this for us um, and continue to enhance this kind of new mode of, of blended delivery. Um, tech support is a necessity for this here. It, I, would, I wouldn't have been able to do this without, without Mark's help, without a doubt. But I just think that we're, we're testing the VR classroom in, in the UX course within an emergent tech module, so it fits for that there. Um, but the students are compiling their accounts of what they thought of it and what they thought of the teaching learning experience. So I can't wait to see what comes back from them. And that's probably our next step in research is, you know, making an account of that, but also a response to that there. And I think that's that's probably where we're heading after this year. Yeah, definitely. And just to add that, it's a question for people to think about, you know, is empathy lost on the desktop, you know, and, and can we sort of further that discussion? That's us, Sean, thank you. That's great, guys. Thanks a million. That was super. Just very quickly again, before I go to see if there's any questions, there was some that were already answered by some uh, participants there. <clears throat> What's the name of the application for the space? Again, sorry, that you use. Spatial.io spatial.io okay so that's yeah because i must look into that and um, you, can use, you can use that on desktop or headset so you can participate well and on mobile as well yeah and i was just going to add if um anyone is in the galway campus and they want to try out an oculus headset i'll get, contact me and we'll, we'll get you set up and I, I if anyone's at the conference or whatever and you want to pop down we'll do some demos at lunchtime tomorrow and Friday if you want to give it a go because it is exceptional it is uh, when you do the games and stuff you 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 begin to realize the potential of the interaction with the, the hands as a game changer really for things you know sure. Have any questions from anyone here we go can you see that guys how will I read it out to you I just see one coming in there from Emmett, Emmett. Uh, Couple of questions. Onboarding students 100% online. So, did you post out the physical headsets to their homes? Yes, Emmett, we did. Um, and we had a couple of issues with that. There, there is a bit of risk, I suppose, with that as well, especially when we were posting to Malaysia. Um, I know there was problems with, with customs and stuff like that, but ended up that the, the headset got to Malaysia before it got to Mayo. So, <laughs> there's uh, <laughs> something, something went right somewhere along the line. So, we, we didn't worry too much. Uh, the second question there is the, the online space. Uh, can you set it up only on your students uh, can access your space room? Yeah, so we set up a single room or, or I set up like a, more or less a house uh, that they could come into to visit. Uh, and then they, they actually set up their spaces in outside in the garden in their in their in this space. So it was uh, kind of surreal, but it, it worked. But you can set up portals from that space and go in and set up innovation rooms, conference rooms and so on. 
So there's, there's, we're only really scratching the surface at the minute. Super, thanks. I think we're nearly through our time now.